the storm that is shifting the sands of geoeconomics. Hi, I'm Alex Lightman, and this is an emergency keynote. The person who's going to do the keynote before, uh, Nick Spanos, um, has been hospitalized, and so they asked me to fill in for him. Coincidentally, I was scheduled to do a workshop in the other room, so th I've cut my presentation in half. It, I did have an hour, and so we just had to cut the slides just now. So I guess they're going to start the clock. They said 30 minutes. I guess they're going to give me 25. All right. No, not 18, 25, that's what we negotiated. Um, okay, so we have an amazing project together, you and me, everybody here. We are doing the most important work on the planet. I think that the most important thing for us to do this decade is to get digital money to over a billion people by 2030. And I won't keep you in suspense, it's guaranteed. I published over two million words about the future and I promise you this will happen in multiple ways. Okay, I'm pushing the button. Wait, no, you said 25, that's, that's 20. 20 is not 25. 25, can you restart the clock, please? Okay, I'm just gonna keep going. Um, your, your, your clicker, yes, here we go. Okay, so I declare that Dubai is the capital of the open world. You can do that when you're a speaker. You can just declare things and people start saying it and it becomes true. And it's my sense from the people that I've met here that people who want to get serious work done come to Dubai. I don't have confirmation because nobody's doing real-time census. There's no real-time tracking like in Captain America, the Winter Soldier, you know, with Hydra and stuff, with these giant helicarriers. But I have been told by a very serious person uh, that Dubai's population has increased 50% from 4 million people to 6 million just the last eight months. If that's true, this is the most successful city in the world in the post-COVID era. So I congratulate you on your competence. I mean, and who wants to be the capital of the closed world? So I want to also thank uh, His Excellency Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. Uh, I think that it has, he's done an absolutely spectacular job. It's a beautiful city. Uh, this is the best meeting place of East and West and North and South and um, the Islamic world, the Ummah, and the rest of the world that I, that I know of. So this is a great opportunity for all of us. All of us can do well and we can make money and we can provide for a better life for our children and our grandchildren seven generations into the future by what we do this decade. And I want to tell you that Dubai is already building on a strength, but it's got another strength. Hamburgers, hot dogs, french fries, alternating current, municipal electric lighting, cornflakes, belly dancing. What do these things have in common? They were all popularized by a world expo, a world fair. And they went from a local phenomenon, where just a few people in one area were doing them, to a global phenomenon. So you have a golden opportunity, and I, Respectfully request, I insist that you seize and capitalize on this and you use the World Expo of Dubai to bring digital money to everybody. Make digital money a big part of your expo. You have an extra year that you got, uh, thanks to Allah, to go and do all these things. So there are five different groups, each of which can bring digital money to a billion people. And the first and the best is our decentralized blockchain community, the people represented here. And I think it's going to be based on a bandwidth hard protocol on IPv6, which is universal addressable identity. I was the first person to make a public company that was based on IPv6. I did this 15 years ago, so it's not a new thing, on mesh networking and peer-to-peer -peer and open source software. The second group, which is not as good, but is still pretty good, and still has some level, it's a combination of centralized and decentralized, is the digital euro, which I think will come out in 2024. And I say this based on the success of GSM, 
which uh, is uh, Nordic mobile radio, had a competition against the French standard, the German standard, and then boom, went all over the world. And from 1G, which was easy to clone and hard to roam, you went to hard to clone and easy to roam. And so you have about, in the European area, about 500 million citizens, but these countries have historical ties to over 100 countries. The Europeans will have to be terrible in execution not to get to a billion people. They just have their own people, and then they find their friendly nations, like Algeria is with France, and so on. The third one is the digital dollar, and I'm an American, and I've done uh, projects for over 40 US government agencies out of 208. I've also done transition plans for NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty uh, Organization. And I've worked for the Obama-Biden White House doing um, some things, including uh, materials that were part of the US resuming diplomatic relations with Cuba. But I'm extremely unimpressed. In fact, I'm embarrassed by how pathetic the US efforts are towards the digital dollar. And when you consider that our whole economy rests on two things, cheap natural gas and the dollar being accepted worldwide, we're kind of screwing up both of them. And then the fourth thing is the digital yuan. It's not blockchain. It's not something that will be a success for the people in this room. But China has, well, I, I am told by high up people that it doesn't have 1.4 billion people. It has 1.75 billion people. So it'd be pretty easy for China to just bring a billion people in just by simply the Co Chinese Communist Party saying, you will use this. And then finally, there's a fifth group, which is a dark horse, but I don't think I can say this right now, but I'll, if you keep in touch, I will, I will let you know. And also, if you just look at the trends that are happening, that will reach that trend of that. Uh, so we basically have about 100 million people out of 8 billion have, are using digital currency today. So this is a very interesting thing. This is the money flower. This is the taxonomy of money. And Mao Zedong um, the, said, let 100 flowers bloom. Well, I say let 100 digital flowers bloom, bloom for a billion people. And so you see over here on the left side, you see universally accessible. Then you have electronic, central bank issued, and peer-to-peer. -peer. And if you see this here, cryptocurrency is right here, central bank issued. They're not actually hugely different. That's why we can win, but that's why also the banks can win, the central banks can win. It will be a very tough race. I want to um, talk about one previous prediction that I made, and that is that uh, my prediction said within 10 years for the value of crypto became 83.3% true within two years. So crypto is growing faster than almost anybody has predicted. So this is a presentation from my talk, Clash of the Titans, what will the drivers be? And I said that the total crypto market might rise, this is, uh, I did this presentation in August of 2019, uh, might rise 10, uh, 10x from 100 billion, uh, sorry, 300 billion at the time to 3 trillion, and the crypto market has reached 2.5 trillion. And so it's definitely going to go to 3 trillion, so my new prediction is it'll, it'll hit by 2028 of more than 10 trillion. And many governments are going to turn their fiat into crypto or into digital money, and assuming regulators and, uh, and governments don't block it, you're, uh, you're going to see a lot of these platforms coming out into the market doing this. Now notice, this is by the way from 2019, the US government did block Telegram. They had a Gram offering. Um, and also you're going to have a lot of users who are machine to machine, not just humans. So you're going to have digital money being used by humanoid robots, by self-driving cars, by IoT devices, by things that are doing machine learning. Now, we have a lot of big problems that these, that these currencies, these digital currencies will go within. So one of them is a degree of deficit. Net borrowing as a share of GDP in select countries, it's uh, pretty scary. The federal deficit in the US is reaching record levels every single week. And you also look at the federal budget deficit as a percentage of GDP. It's almost unimaginable that 20 years we had surpluses, that the federal government of the United States was taking in more money than it was spending. And then we also have um, global financial problems, 280 trillion, it's probably up to 300 trillion right now, supply chain disruptions, and I'll be on a panel later with, uh, chaired by my friend John uh, Sutton about supply chain, so I, I highly recommend you come to that. Uh, global travel disruptions, uh, the current pandemics, 
it's untrue that this is a once in a 100 year pandemic. Um, it, there will be others, they will be faster and faster and more frequent, and budget deficits and raising taxes. And then also there's this scam coin that's out there. Um, so somebody was telling me about this thing, this scam coin that has 27 trillion in circulation, an unlimited supply cap, only one node, 25% of the supply has been inflated in the last six months, and 1% of the coin holders own 30%. Um, and you can see over here, this is the supply. See that it goes like this, and then it goes straight up like a rocket. I'm just kidding, that's not actually a scam coin. That's the US dollar. And something like this is guaranteed to fail. So we have supply chain disruptions, and I just wanna show you that this over here on the right, this containers, the norm for a container to cost to ship goods Basically, a 40-foot container from Shanghai to Los Angeles is the white line, and the blue or purple one is Shanghai to Rotterdam. They're about $1,000 to $2,000, and now it's $4,000 from Shanghai to LA, and it's $9,000. That means all the cost of goods are going through the roof, and this is the travel disruption that we're seeing. And then also, we are seeing a big changeover in the top 10 most valuable companies. So on the extreme right, you have 2008, the 10 most valuable companies. Six of them were oil and energy, three were telecom and IT services, and one was financial. 10 years later in 2018, there were seven platforms with data and information technology, two financial. And then, what are they gonna be in 2028? I think they're all gonna be companies that are using the blockchain better than other people. It will be a complete shift in, in all of this. I don't think that Google is that smart about using blockchain? I don't think Facebook is. I, don't, I just see that all these guys will be replaced in the top 10. We also have hyperinflation coming, like Weimar Germ Germany or like Zimbabwe, and it's very important for people to have an alternative. We have fragile and failing states. What happens with money uh, next? I know that some of you from UAE care. This is graded stable. Um, the, uh, you know, the kind of bright blue, purplish thing I'm a little bit colorblind. Uh, those are the highest level of stability. But the world is filled with states that are on the borderline of failing. And Lester Brown said something that hit me very hard. He said, how many failed states can you have before you have a failed civilization? It's a good question. I ask myself that question at least once a day. Can Bitcoin become the global reserve currency? Well, it's kind of interesting because the more that hyperinflation becomes known by the world, the more the demand will be for Bitcoin. Which country has the highest percentage of people who own Bitcoin? Anybody know? No, it's Nigeria, 36%. So if you look at these populations and what they're forecast to be in 2030, all of these countries are going to have, they have very uh, busybody interfering governments. They're going to have money transfer restrictions. They're going to have high inflation guaranteed by their policies. And they're more than 3 billion people. So without China, you're going to have more than a billion people fleeing in terror for their life savings being destroyed to digital money. And I want to say something that I hope that people will here in a constructive spirit, but it may sound pretty harsh. This is from Friedrich Hayek, who been the, one of the people in the Austrian school. With the exception only of the period of the gold standard, practically all governments of history have used their exclusive power to issue money to defraud and plunder the people. And then you can look at the value of gold, the fiat, and crypto. Gold has maintained its value for over 5,000 years. And I call, this is my phrase, Bitcoin is the atomic clock of money with known supply for the past 10 and a half years and for the next 130 years plus zero counterfeiting. So I have a question for you. How many US dollars are there right now? How many are, will there be in 10 years? How many of them are counterfeit? We don't know. And now we have an alternative that we know the exact supply and we know who owns them because we have the blockchain and the ownership is on the blockchain. The blockchain and identity is pseudonymous, but it's not anonymous. Nobody knows because it's a religious article of faith to believe in fiat without knowing any real numbers or being able to verify anything ever. You can't verify the past. 
You can't verify the present, and you cannot predict the future. I'm one of the best predictors in the future, and I have no idea. And that's why I keep so little, you might have heard me in the, sec the panel just a minute ago saying I keep almost no money in US dollars. So let's go back to Hayek. The history of coinage is an almost uninterrupted story of debasement. History is largely a history of inflation engineered by governments for their gain. Why, government, why is the government monopoly of the provision of money regarded as something that's indispensable? Why must we put up with this? It's deprived the public of the opportunity to discover and use better reliable money. Blessed will be the day, said Hayek, when it will no longer be from the beneficence and the benevolence of government that we expect good money, but instead from the regard of the banks for their own interest. And to what we could add the different companies, Casper, and the, you know, the Bitcoin people, and the Ethereum people, and the, all the forks that are happening. The golden age of analog money is over. The money that's made of ink and wood pulp and metal is dying. And I say a slow death here, but I looked at the statistics again, it actually isn't that slow. It's fast, and I'll show you in the middle. Replaced by bits of information zipping around the world. In more and more places, physical cash is illegal, or it has a death date. We know when it will die in that country because it will no longer be legal. Just like there are certain countries that have put deadlines on the end of internal combustion engines or on the uh, use of gasoline. So Dubai is very lucky that it's not dependent on oil and that it's made this transition to a services economy. And you have a parallel economic operating system of private money that flourishes alongside it, moving peer to peer for everything from loans to buying a used lamp. And in a cashless society, um, I went to university in Sweden, I speak some Swedish, and in, we know the death date of money in Sweden. It's March 24th, 2023. Cash will no longer, excuse me, be accepted as a means of payment. There's a law in Sweden that enables merchants to make customers pay electronically, in spite of the fact that they supposedly, the Reichsbank uh, says that cash is legal tender. You, can, you as a merchant can say, I don't want your dirty money. And according to the latest, latest uh, global payments report, uh, basically they're only thinking about in Australia, they're projecting around 2% of transactions in cash by 2024, which is a big drop from last year, 8.3%. Also, China is just an amazing uh, squeezing of cash out of the system. And also there are concerns about COVID. People don't want to touch money that somebody could put their, their SARS-CoV-2 germs on. And if you look at these bars, this is the shrinking between 2010 and 2020 of the percentage of cash that's in transactions. And it's gonna be replaced by central bank digital currencies and cryptos, and you have governments increasingly banning it. And so here's, these are all the countries that are working on the uh, central bank digital currency tracker. So as you see, Russia's working on it, and China has already released it, and almost all the major countries, probably the GDP of 95% of the world is working on these central bank digital currencies. It's a fact, but this is what's great. You have an incredible opportunity to do what Wayne Gretzky, the hockey player said. I, they said, how could you score so many goals in hockey? And he said, I skate to where the puck is going. Well, where's the puck is going? It's going to digital currency, but you can get there sooner. I mean, in theory, Dubai could create the digital currency that the whole world uses and have this incredible advantage of seniorage, of the ability to print money. Here in this, uh, you have it. You have the World Expo. You have a superpower. So here's a couple of scenarios for 2030, which will be here in the blink of an eye. Like one day, you'll blink your eyes and you'll remember this talk and suddenly you'll realize it's 2030. It happens very fast. So before 2030, all the major economic authorities will issue their own central bank digital currencies. China has already started it with the digital yuan. The US is definitely going to do it. They're not putting out many announcements, but I have good sources. It's definitely in the works. They just don't know how to do it without crashing the, the dollar that exists now. But you have to remember one thing about the United States. The Federal Reserve note, the US dollar that we call now, it's not our first currency. That one's only been around for just over 100 years. Before that, anybody know what the currency of the United States was called? Nobody knows? So this is a blind spot for people. We don't teach this in history. We don't teach that US currencies go to zero. We don't teach that all fiat always goes to zero. It was called the continental. 
And it used to be that people would say, not worth the continental because it crashed to zero. And also the uh, currency of the Confederacy crashed to zero. The dollar, as we know it today, will crash to zero. It's mathematically guaranteed. And so the Chinese central bank digital currency is going to be the first currency to get to a billion people. But all that's guaranteed is China. And you can't really assume it's going to do that well because, well, only today, about 2 or 3% of international trades are done in the yuan or renminbi, while about 63% of the dollar is used for that and about 27% of the euro. So why is it that 75% of bitcoins are made in China even though it's illegal, but only 2 3% of their trades? Well, because they're only making it illegal for the competition. So this isn't playing well with others. This isn't creating alliances, partnership. This whole conference is about making alliances and partnerships. And I loved what my friend uh, Crystal uh, Rose Pierce said. It's like, I'm here, I wanna do projects with you. Let's do projects. I'm gonna say that too, I'm kind of copying her, but I wanna do projects with you. That's why I'm here, to make friends and do projects together. But the digital Euro and the US and other countries have a chance to beat China to a billion people spread across the world. And these central bank digital currencies are going to have rivals in Bitcoin and Ethereum and other cryptos and digital dollars. There's almost nothing to say about the digital dollar. It's very sad. We should have somebody really powerful, really amazing that everybody respects in charge of this project and we should start doing it now. The US government should be here in Dubai begging to use the digital dollar at the World Expo and that we don't have a person who's an ambassador for the digital dollar is shocking and horrifying to me. So crypto isn't only about money. It's about voting. It's about finance. It's about protecting value over time, protecting value over space. It's about granularity. It's about lower latency. It's about insurance. It's about logistics, knowing who is doing what with whom where so we can squeeze the bugs out of our system. And speed is key. We need to improve our transactions, we need to have 24-7 markets, we need to allow for artificial intelligence and machine learning to be our allies. And we need to improve our transaction speeds for cryptocurrencies. So I'm working on getting uh, speeding up Packet as an example. And here's Packet's mission statements. Let's build a network that's operated by the people, help people monetize their internet connections. So just like Uber lets people monetize their car and Airbnb lets them monetize their apartment, their bungalow, their flat. Um, this is monetizing your Wi-Fi. So I stuck a little machine that was the size of a hardcover book, and I basically generated a packet, and that packet right now, mm, I don't know, maybe it's worth a million dollars, something like that. It's crazy. Um, and then you can decentralize internet access, you can lower the cost of high-speed bandwidth, you can mitigate control and censorship of the internet. Um, it uses something interesting that I think should be the standard because uh, Elon Musk caused hundreds of billions of dollars to be lost when he complained about proof of work being environmentally damaging. Well, yeah, that's because 75% of Bitcoin is mined in China and it's almost all using coal. So this renewable energy for Bitcoin is true of things outside of China. But imagine proof of bandwidth. Uh, Packet is the first thing to do that. I love it. You can come up and talk to me about it. It's a decentralized project that's raised no money. If there's no, there, nobody's gone to venture capitalists. They just, we all did it as a community. And basically it gives users the ability to share their smartphone's bandwidth and get rewards. And M-commerce is shooting up. I now have to look at, I have three, three minutes left. Uh, basically we've sh shortcut 10 years of transition. So brick and mortar was the majority of sales in 2019. And it was expected to take until about 2027, 2028 for online purchases to exceed real world purchases. And, uh, but it happened, it happened last year. And if you look at my Lightman report, that was my very first Lightman report on the great transition. Um, so I wanna say also, it's not enough just to say that somebody, yeah, let's have somebody else get it to a billion people. I personally am going to work on getting digital currency to a billion people. I'm doing that myself. And the way that I'm doing it is with the company I started called Kimoji, and we do keyboards. And Real Madrid, uh, Beeline has it in Russian, Warner Music Group, MTN, which is in Nigeria, Tottenham Hotspur. All these keyboards are coming out, which will facilitate mobile commerce 
And because of this, that'll become the majority. And uh, the keyboard is used 120 times a day. It's by far 10 times the most used application, and it's a direct channel to people to do it. And you can promote all of your different content. I also just started a company uh, called KeyPay, which is uh, the sister company of Keymoji, which is doing mobile wallets and doing digital money in them and getting cash back for all that. It's very exciting, all these different possibilities. Um, and we're also going to be making fan tokens and NFTs for people. We're setting up a bank. I'm in Puerto Rico. It's a, I, I'm pretty sure that our first round of funding will set the record for the best first round of funding ever in the history of Puerto Rico for a technology company. And my last slide, uh, getting the, the, to this billion people threshold needs new technologies and new approaches. So digital payments adaptation can reach a billion people before 2030. The contenders are central bank digital currencies, CBDC, we're going to be seeing that acronym a lot, uh, decentralized currencies, uh, corporate private money, and this requires creating user-friendly, relevant mobile apps. We had a gentleman earlier today from Icon talking about user interface. That was a good presentation. And I personally think, uh, I challenge you to do more than I'm doing to get digital currency. So I'm doing it with KeyPay, Kimoji, and Packet. And basically, the game is up. Anybody can win. Any company can win. Any city can win. Any emirate can win. Any country can win. And who's going to have the digital currency that we all use. Thank you for your time and thank you Iman Pulis for letting me be here. <laughs> 29 seconds to spare.